across the board next week. All right, gonna, appreciate um, that. I'm going to go ahead and um, start the process, so just give me a few minutes to start yep. the live stream. Okay, Mayor, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. So good evening, everybody. I want to call the June 11th Citrusite City Council meeting to uh, order, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Amy, if you have a wonderful flag, I appreciate it. Hands of your heart, I pledge of allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, United States of, America. of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So if you would call the roll, Amy, that would be appreciative. Councilmember Bruins. Present. Councilmember Daniels. Here. Councilmember Middleton. Present. Vice Mayor Miller. Here. And Mayor Slowey. Present. Thank you. Video statement, please. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast. Oh, unfortunately, we're having technical difficulties tonight, so it will not be live on Metro Cable 14. We do have it via YouTube live through the city's website at citrusheights.net. Um, the meeting will be recorded and replayed on Metro Cable 14 on Sunday, June 4th, 14th at 9 a.m., and a DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Great, thank you for that. <clears throat> Amy, next item is approval of the agenda. And the only thing I wanna bring up is during um, council comments, uh, I'm going to ask the chief <clears throat> to give his department report then rather than waiting to the uh, end of the meeting. So with that, uh, I will take a motion from the council. If that change, I'll move approval of the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Amy, since this is video, I, we need a roll call. Sorry. Councilmember Ruins? Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. <clears throat> Thank you. The motion passes. <clears throat> so, you know, to the public, I would be remiss if I didn't start off. <clears throat> saying that we're definitely living in unusual times. I mean, the pandemic, the lockdown, the governor's stay at home order, millions of folks unemployed. More recently, the uh, protests over George Floyd's death that have also brought around in some cities, riots and uh, other things. All in all, I want you to know that the council takes these matters seriously. We're uh, looking forward in the near future to be able to uh, go back to uh, live in-person meetings. And I want to assure you that the CHPD is on the job, doing their best to keep us all safe and secure while continuing to do so both professionally, honorably, and with utmost respect for all those involved in their interactions. So with that, before I do uh, the council comments, I'm going to turn it uh, over to uh, Chief Lawrence for a, a few words. Chief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. It's uh, an honor to give this report tonight. And I think very important for me to address you and our community. And I want you to know that the tragic incident that happened on May 25th, the, the murder of uh, Mr. Floyd was sickening to all of us. And I can tell you that the Citrus Heights Police Department uh, stands with our community in, in just as much shock and sadness as all of you. I can tell you that we don't condone that type of activity here, or that type of behavior, and that that does not exist in our police department, nor would we allow it. So I just wanted you to know that piece before I started my report, because uh, there are our good, hardworking police professionals are just as upset as our community members for that incident. Um, I, I will say that, um, of course, this has sparked a lot of uh, civil unrest throughout our nation. 
Uh, there's been a lot of peaceful and lawful protests and demonstrations, which have been fantastic. People have uh, their exercised their First Amendment right, which we uh, believe in strongly, and we have taken an oath to ensure that they have the ability to do that. And uh, we're proud to say that uh, uh, we've had many people express their thoughts and opinions, and that's why we live in a great country, because they can. Uh, and we, we stand ready to guard their right to do just that in a safe manner. Um, here in the Sacramento region, uh, most of the unrest uh, and the demonstrations have been in this downtown Sacramento area. Uh, unfortunately, some of those have led to uh, some unlawful protests, some demonstrations that were uh, led to property damage and even injuries. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't believe that most of those were the uh, members protesting. Those were actually outside actors or agitators who were looking for an opportunity to cause disruption. Uh, and so that's unfortunate because I think it, it distorts or eclipses some of the message. Um, here in Citrus Heights, we have had a few uh, small protests. They've largely been at the uh, Sunrise Mall, corner of Sunrise and Greenback. They've been uh, 20 people or less, typically. Uh, proud to say that they've been very lawful and peaceful, and uh, they're, they are uh, protesting as one should uh, in a very lawful manner. And so kudos to them for uh, doing that and, and doing it safely. We have had, though, here in Citrus Heights, some crimes of opportunity that are not related to any of the uh, protests. We had uh, uh, several incidents of looting, people breaking into businesses and burglarizing, uh, looting them. On May 31st, we made 11 arrests for looting here in Citrus Heights. Uh, and I want to point out that uh, none of the people we arrested that night for looting lived in Citrus Heights. They all came from out of the area uh, to do damage uh, and commit crimes in our city. Um, we estimate the loss and damage of those, those incidents of that one single night to be upwards of around $20,000. We've also had, and you've seen it reported in the media, a few incidents of people burning flags, American flags that were attached to residential homes. There were three flags burned. Uh, Citrus Heights Police Department is actively uh, investigating those incidents of arson, uh, and we hope to have uh, that case resolved as quickly as possible, uh, and um, hopefully we won't have any more incidents like that. We uh, closely keep in contact with our allied agencies around us, uh, as well as uh, the FBI, and uh, constantly monitoring for intelligence that would uh, lead us to believe that there might be criminal activity uh, around us or coming into our city. Uh, and I wanted to share with our community that on social media, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation there. We have discovered, especially in the last few weeks, that there are uh, intention people that are intentionally uh, putting out misleading information that uh, is designed to cause fear, is designed to cause panic, is designed to really cause uh, a lot of confusion. And so my my request of the community is to make sure when you see things or hear things on social media, you read things, uh, to find a reliable source to ensure that uh, what you're reading is accurate, because uh, quite often uh, it's not. Uh, so we've been trying to put out information from Citrus Heights on facts that we know. We will only report on the facts. We'll only report on things that we know uh, or believe to be true. Uh, and I would encourage our, our community to ensure that they're doing I want to talk a little bit as I finish here about police use of force. And last year in California, the California Police Chiefs Association, ironically, while I was president, uh, we championed uh, some use of force reform here in California. There were two bills in particular that we worked very closely with a lot of stakeholders, including the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, uh, as well as other stakeholders. That was Assembly Bill 92 and Senate Bill 230. Both of those bills were designed to uh, reform police use of force in California. And those laws, I'm proud to say, take place uh, January 1st. Uh, but most agencies are already implementing the changes that are coming in, those, in that legislation, including to the private police department. Uh, and I, I want to tell you that, that those two bills made California policing, just, just this last legislative season, uh, the most comprehensive and the uh, most restrictive police use of force policies in the nation. We, we uh, surveyed uh, police agencies across the United States. And we picked out the very best uh, pieces of it. And I'm proud to say that we came to consensus with the ACLU and other stakeholders on what that should look like. And what it has led to is California leading the nation 
And frankly, as the Police Chiefs Association will tell you, uh, what we need is the other states in our nation to adopt those same uh, good standards because they are designed to reduce uh, issues of use of force as many as often as we possibly can. Uh, and we need other states to uh, to become more professional and adopt those same types of standards so that these incidents don't happen and that we can uh, stop uh, the tragedies such as May 25th. Uh, here in Citrus Heights, I want you to know that our officers receive training on use of force throughout the year constantly. We're constantly reviewing our policies and we're we uh, routinely train our officers on use of force. But not only use of force, here in Citrus Heights, we've gone beyond that. We train our officers in something called procedural justice. And procedural justice at its core is really about how we treat people, how we understand uh, that everyone has a different lens with which they see things through, and that we treat people with professionalism, with respect, and with dignity, um, regardless of our encounter with them, even if it's somebody uh, maybe even especially if it's somebody we're arresting. We treat them with dignity, with professionalism, and with care. And there's four pillars in procedural justice that we train our officers on. Uh, the first one is fairness in the process. The second one is transparency in actions. The third one is opportunities for voice. And the fourth one is impartiality in decision making. Those are powerful things. And I want you to know that the culture of our police department here wholeheartedly believes in those pillars and we believe in treating our community with the utmost respect and professionalism. In addition, our officers are required to read and uh, sign they acknowledge and understand all of the department's policies and procedure, particularly those surrounding use of force, control devices, uh, taser guidelines, officer-involved shooting protocols, discriminatory harassment, and standards of conduct. Each year they have to acknowledge that they've reread and understand and will adhere to those uh, policies and procedures. And I'll just close with this, Mr. Mayor. I want to uh, specifically thank not only our police department, the men and women of Citrus Heights Police Department that do a very challenging, a very dangerous job that is often very thankless. Uh, and they do it with pride, with professionalism, and they do it because they care about this community. Uh, and, and that leads me to my second thanks, and that's to all of you. The people in our community have had a tremendous outpouring of support for their police department. Uh, we feel your love. We feel your respect. And I want you to know that we are there for you and always will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief Lawrence. I appreciate your time. I, I have to say I'm a little shocked to hear everything I don't see on social media is not true. You burst my bubble there, but uh, I'll get over that. So, All right. So with that, let's get on with uh, council comments. Uh, I will start with uh, council member Bruins. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Slowey. Um, first of all, I just want to start off by saying thank you to our chief for the fine job that he does in his, uh, his whole department. Especially proud that you uh, led the uh, Police uh, Chiefs Association last year. And what a, a red letter year you had in um, um, your success in getting this legislation through. And I'm very proud of you, Chief. Uh, the only thing that I have to report, because there's not a lot of face-to-face -face meetings nowadays, is that I virtually attended the Chamber's lunch on Tuesday and I want to thank our mayor for his uh, thorough report on what all that the city's doing during this time. And um, uh, just fine job, well done, Jeff. And um, that's all I have to report. Thank you, Council Member Bruins. Council Member Daniels, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, nothing to report. Uh, just thoughts and prayers with everybody. And I uh, just want to say hi to my little princess at home, Savannah. Yeah, you'll be home soon. Thank you, sir. Council Member Middleton. Nothing to report. Um, no face to face meetings at this time, but I do want to echo some of the sentiments that have been said about the chief and the great job that he's done this past year. And I'm very proud that he led the charge on a lot of things to help reform things for our communities and to keep them safe, but also keep our officers safe. So thank you again for all your hard work. And I hope that you will continue it for a long, long, long time. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Middleton. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Miller. Well, I actually have a couple of meetings to report on. Uh, Monday evening, attended the regional transit meeting. And uh, as I discussed about the May meeting, we did actually hear the uh, budget and uh, passed a balanced budget update. 
A lot of that I can attribute to the CARE Act. Uh, otherwise, I think we'd be looking at layoffs and furloughs. Uh, so right now, uh, RT's above water and uh, should be for the next two years. We'll see what happens after that with our economy. Uh, today, we had a Sacramento Transportation Authority meeting. Uh, we did have a presentation from the uh, University of Pacific Center for Business and Policy Research on the economic impact of a proposed Measure A sales tax. Of course, it's all good and rosy, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, we also, uh, the board also prioritized five projects that are being submitted to the California Transportation Commission uh, for possible funding, and the board decided that uh, number one priority would be South Watt Avenue improvements. Uh, the second would be the Sac Valley Station Loop to Township 9, which is double tracking. Um, number three is the White Rock Road Safety and Congestion Relief Project. Four was Camera Road in Elk Grove to complete reconstruction, and it, it is a complete reconstruction of the road. And the fifth it would be Alberta Road improvements, and we'll see which ones uh, make the cut. Also with uh, regional transit transitioning to public ADA services for disabled and seniors, uh, STA confirmed SACOG's acceptance of SAC RT as, as a consolidated transportation service agency for, urbanized, for the urbanized area of our county and regional transit will receive 70% of the current Measure A funds, which is amounts to about 4.5% 4, 4 of all Measure A funds generated each year for the senior and disabled transportation services. And finally, I'd just like to chime in and, and thank the chief for his leadership and, and thank the men and women of the Citrus Heights Police Department for their professionalism and keeping us safe from those that would take advantage of the situation current, currently. And we are fortunate to have such a great group of professionals serving our community. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Miller. I, I too don't have a lot to report. As Jeannie mentioned, uh, I did um, speak at the chamber virtual meeting earlier in the week. Um, I know most of the neighborhood associations probably aren't meeting, but when you get back to meeting, if any of them want me to come by and give that little talk, I'd be happy to. And again, thank you to the chief, all the men and women of the CHPD, but also thank you to the public. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we generally have a public that loves our uh, officers and, you know, um, for the most part, we, you know, we have crime. We'd be foolish to say we don't, but it's nice to live in a community where there's respect uh, on both sides of the aisle and, and that's how I think it should be. So <clears throat> with that, next item, Amy. The next item is public comment, uh, and I do not have any public comment um, at this time. Okay, next item then. Next item is consent calendar items 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Great, thank you. What's the pleasure of the council? Move approval of consent. Second. So... Motion approved by Council Member Bruins, second by Vice Mayor Miller. Amy, roll call, please. Council Member Bruins. Aye. Council Member Daniels. Aye. Council Member Middleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Miller. Aye. And Mayor Slowey. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, on to the regular calendar. Next item, Amy. The next item, number 12, the subject is fiscal years 2019-20 and 2020-21 mid-cycle budget review. The recommendation is to receive and file the report and adopt a resolution approving amendments to the fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Okay, is that going to be by Rhonda or somebody else? Yes. Oh, you're there in person. Okay. I, 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 I was looking for you on the Zoom, and I'm like, she's not here. <laughs> nope, I'm here. I'm here. Well, good okay. evening, Council Members and Mayor Slowey. I'm Rhonda Rivera, Assistant City Manager, and this evening I will be sharing the mid-cycle budget review. I'll be reviewing the previously adopted budget and our updated projections for this fiscal year and the next. We've spent hundreds of hours putting together these projections to help us continue to make informed decisions aligned with our core values of fiscal prudence and transparency. Please keep in mind that we're presenting projections with the assumption that our economy will reopen this summer and that there will not be a second wave of the virus and associated health orders. 
We've also based these projections on not receiving any state or federal assistance to ass address our recovery efforts in Citrus Heights. Cities our size have been left out of the three COVID-19 related stimulus packages passed at the federal level. I wanted to start by giving some background information. The city is very fortunate to have adopted a two-year budget last year on June 13, 2019. Our new two-year budget has provided us stability during a time of crisis so that we can be flexible, adaptive, and responsive. In addition to several finance committee updates given on the dates listed here, we also gave our first mid-year budget review to council in February. Since the COVID-19 pandemic emergency began in March 2020, council and our budget committee have received frequent financial updates. We had a closed session debrief on the budget with the city council in April, and we are now here to present our budget projections for fiscal years 2019-2020 and 2021 to reflect the impacts of COVID-19. We will continue to forecast and research. We know the COVID-19 situation is ever evolving and we will remain adaptive and responsive. So here is a recap of what was adopted for the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget. Before COVID-19 in June of 2020, at that time, the general fund was predicted to have revenue of about 31.6 million, projected expenditures of about 33 million, and an adopted operating shortfall of 1.4 million. I want to talk briefly about our city's long anticipated operating shortfall. We've known since incorporation that there would be a period when our expenditures would be higher than our revenues and this is primarily due to the property tax agreement required by the county to allow our city to incorporate and initiate local control in Citrus Heights. As council will remember, staff recommended in November of 2018 that the city establish a line of credit as a strategic financing tool to sustain us during the expected crossover period. The fiscal year 2019-2020 budget implemented that recommendation and utilized 1.3 million from the line of credit and about 71,000 of reserve funds to address the anticipated shortfall. Again, this is what we had adopted for fiscal year 1920 in June of 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic. This slide represents our current adjusted projections for this fiscal year in response to COVID-19 and its effect on the global economy. Obviously, we could not have predicted that a global pandemic was around the corner, but city staff took immediate action to mitigate economic impacts and forecast what this would mean for our city's budget. We anticipate sales tax revenue will be down almost a million dollars below what we had projected for this fiscal year. We were, however, able to recover about 300,000 from unanticipated one-time refunds and reimbursements, including restitution for damage to public property and prior year risk management premiums. And from the start of this fiscal year, our staff were already devoted to saving as much as possible and prior to COVID-19, reduced expenses for fiscal year 2019-2020 by $1 million. So now looking ahead to what was adopted for the next fiscal year, council approved the following for the 2020-2021 budget. Revenue was estimated at 31.9 million, projected expenditures were at 33.6, and we had an anticipated operating shortfall of 1.7 million. Again, this budget was adopted prior to COVID-19 and council previously approved the utilization of 1.2 million from the existing line of credit and about 525 of general fund reserves to balance the budget. As we look to adjust the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget to reflect COVID-19 impacts, we're projecting the following. Sales tax is predicted to be down 1.4 million. Some of this will be mitigated with an increase in motor vehicle licensing fee revenue of about 200,000. 
but we also have had an increase in expenditure because of risk management premiums increasing throughout our state. So taking the predictions I've just covered, I want to focus your attention on the fact that we had initially anticipated a shortfall of about 1.7 million for fiscal year 2020-2021. But after COVID-19 impacts, we are now projecting a deficit of almost 3.4 million. Despite this newly calculated deficit, you'll notice city staff are not proposing an increase to the draw on the city's line of credit. After the previously approved draw from our line of credit of 1.2 million, we now have a projected shortfall of about 2.2 million for the next fiscal year. To address this shortfall, city staff will continue with the immediate actions we've already taken to mitigate COVID-19's impacts on our city. These include continuing to monitor the COVID-19 situation so we adapt our budget forecasting and make plans for our road to recovery, maintain our expenditure reductions by holding personnel vacancies, and continuing to prioritize and defer capital costs. Consistent with our commitment to fiscal prudence, our next steps include staff coming back to council several, several times with budget updates. All this being said, I would be remiss if I did not mention that our city's next steps also include continuing to serve our community through this pandemic and beyond. We are proud to participate in the Great Plates program and are averaging about 3,600 meals a week for our COVID-19 at-risk population. We've prioritized local business support through our Economic Development Division. They have been providing information about financial relief options, hosting Q&As, and summarizing state and county directives so that our business community knows what's needed to reopen and safely resume operations. We are constantly updating important information and updates related to COVID-19 in Citrus Heights to provide a one-stop resource to the community online. We are also gathering community feedback on priorities so we can align the city's efforts for recovery. And last but certainly not least, we continue to honor the promise of public safety that comes from having a local police department and local control. And looking ahead to the long range financial forecast, um, now along the same lines of committing to fiscal responsibility and planning for recovery, I will invite our consultant Bill Zanoni up to present a snapshot of the city's long range financial forecast. Thank you, Rhonda. Welcome, Bill. Good evening. I'm Bill Zanoni with uh, Municipal Resource Group. There we go. <laughs> so this evening, I'm going to provide uh, provide you with an update on the city's general fund long-range financial plan. Um, this forecast covers the 10-year period from fiscal year 2019-20 through 28-29. Um, and is based upon information that's currently available. As we've discussed previously, there are several reasons for developing and updating a financial forecast. Uh, the first is to exercise fiscal prudence as stewards of public funds. The second reason is to demonstrate fiscal responsibility by conducting strategic fiscal planning um, and to identify potential issues well in advance of their occurrence and to develop a corrective action plan. The City Council last received an update on the general fund financial forecast in February, just about four months ago. As you've just heard from the Assistant City Manager, the City has a commitment to leadership transparency, and fiscal responsibility. This city has been proactive in implementing a number of cost-saving measures over the past several years, um, including uh, streamlined levels of staffing achieved through departmental reorganizations, renegotiating labor contracts to increase benefit cost-sharing, 
aggressively exploring opportunities for outside grant funding and partnerships with um, other entities wherever possible and diligently uh, prioritizing the city's expenditures for operating costs, capital needs, public safety fleet and other equipment needs and unfunded liabilities. These efforts have proven especially prudent as the city now looks to recover from the effects of COVID-19. This financial forecast, um, as I said, is a look forward over a 10 year period and is based on historical trends, information which is currently available and key assumptions about the future, keeping in mind the current volatility um, of, our, of our economy. <clears throat> this forecast assumes that the impact of COVID-19 will continue only through uh, next fiscal year. We have not included in this analysis the potential uh, fiscal impact of a second wave um, of the COVID pandemic. The forecast assumes an inflation rate for revenues and expenditures in the range of two and a half to three percent. We're assuming that the city will begin to receive property tax revenue, its share of property tax revenue under a tax sharing agreement with Sacramento County beginning in 2023 and that the city will fully utilize and then repay the 2018 line of credit financing. Financial forecast also <clears throat> assumes the, that there will be minimal funding for the replacement of public safety fleet and other, uh, and other city equipment. We have assumed no capital funding for the first seven years of the forecast period. And then only $3 million during each of the last three years, which is significantly less than the city's capital funding needs. And this financial plan identifies the minimum prudent level of general fund reserves as stated in the city council approved reserve policy, and which is also the minimum benchmark used by other cities um, and a measurement by which the fiscal health of a public agency is evaluated. And finally, there is no funding provided in the current two-year budget in 1920 or in 2021 for the city's long-term OPEB obligation. And we've only included the minimum actuarial required contribution um, in the assumptions for the remaining eight years of the forecast period. So based upon the assumptions which I've just discussed, we have projected that the city's general fund will experience an operating shortfall where revenues are insufficient to meet expenditures during eight years of the 10 year forecast period and that property tax revenue that the city will begin receiving in fiscal year 22-23 will not be sufficient to fully resolve this situation. Because of the anticipated revenue shortfall, we've assumed that the city will draw down reserves significantly below the minimum prudent level each year and that the city's general fund cash will be depleted and in fact be negative during three of our 10 year forecast period, which will require some type of uh, outside funding or other corrective action. And again, these, these projected results also assume that the city's capital needs are significantly underfunded. This chart illustrates what I uh, just went over um, in a, the illustration of the currently forecasted general fund revenues and expenditures looking out 10 years. Obviously, it's difficult to predict budgets precisely, especially going out that far, but this 10-year tool is meant to help us plan for the future as best we can. You'll see on the chart as it stands, with all of the assumptions that I just discussed, we're looking at a revenue shortfall in eight of the 10 years. Anytime the red line, which is expenditures, is above the blue line, 
which are anticipated revenues, it means that the city is tapping into general fund reserves. I've pointed out that the influx of property tax revenue in fiscal year 22-23, you can see with that first arrow where the blue line revenues uh, spike up in 22-23, that reflects the property tax revenue coming in, as well as the scheduled payoff of the city's line of credit financing in fiscal year 24-25. And you can see that red line where it, it spikes up and then comes, comes down. That's the, the final payment on the line of credit financing. Again, please keep in mind that there are major capital projects that are not reflected in the expenditure, in the expenditure red line. Um, if we were to illustrate those capital needs, which would include, for example, funding uh, for residential street maintenance, there would be a third line, which would be far above our current expenditure pr uh, predictions. Staff is working diligently right now to develop recommendations for council to address the shortfall illustrated here. Um, and we'll be coming back to council in the near future with su suggestions and additional research. So to conclude, the next step will include uh, continued assessment, prioritization, and reporting out on the city's unfunded needs, identification and implementation of additional operating efficiencies, which I can say will be difficult as this city has already made significant efforts to reduce costs and operates in a, a very lean budget, and, and provide this, the city council with additional information and recommendations. So at this point, I will hand the presentation back to Rhonda Rivera, who will present the action items associated with review of the current two-year budget, and then will be available for questions. Thank you, Bill. Transition here. So um, we've just presented then the, our mid-cycle budget review as well as given an update on what we have for our projections for changes needed for the 2020-2021 budget. And So what we are asking for council um, for this evening is that they adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2021 general fund budget, updating the revenues and the expenditures and um, filing the report, receiving filing the report for the uh, update on the 2019-20 budget. Are there any questions? Questions for either Rhonda or Bill. Uh, hi, I have a question. Council Member Bruins, go. Do these projections, um, both the next year's and uh, forecast out 10 years, take into consideration that uh, or, or not include any staffing uh, increases that's going forward just with the vacancies we have now um, remaining? The, the, the forecast assumes the current level of staffing throughout the 10-year period. We have not added any additional staff into the forecast. Okay. Well, you know, that concerns me because I don't know how realistic that is, um, how, how we're going to be able to get through the next 10 years without having the, without looking at our staffing needs. But um, at this point in time, I realize that this is what we have to do. So thank you. I agree. And that's, as, as I indicated, this is a very lean budget that we're starting with as our base. Right. Right. And we also realize that as more information comes in, you're constantly updating long term as well as current. So, uh, yes. Yeah, it's it is what it is based on what you know today. So appreciate that. Additional questions for Rhonda or Bill? 
turn it back okay. over to Amy. Hearing none, I think there's a couple of actions your guys are looking for. So, Amy, if you could go back a page or two so we can. There we go. I think we only have one one item to vote on. What one is a receive? Right, I'm sorry, file. you're right. Receive and file, and the other one is a re uh, resolution right. right here. Okay, so I move to approve the resolution of the city council of the city of Citrus Heights, uh, approving the amendments as stated to the 2021 and 21 budget. Okay. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Bruins, a second by Councilmember Middleton. Amy, roll call, please. Councilmember Bruins? Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. The motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Amy. Thank uh, you, Rhonda and Bill. Appreciate that. Next item, please, Madam Clerk. The next item is regular calendar item number 13. The subject is Great Plates Delivered Restaurant Contract Amendments. And the recommendation is there are uh, six resolutions for council's consideration um, to execute um, an agreement with Beach Hut Deli, Boston's Pizza, Ciro's Pizza, Dos Coyotes Border Cafe, NorCal Subs, and Arvita Cantina for the Great Plates Delivered Program. Okay. And I will ask our esteemed attorney when we get there, do you want six separate motions or can we take one? Sorry, Mayor. These are uh, six different contracts. We're going to do six different uh, okay. actions, please. I, I don't even know why I asked. <laughs> you knew the answer before you asked. <laughs> I did. I know. Sorry to say. All right. Is this uh, Catherine or is this uh, Chris Myers? Chris. Who's Chris. Well, well, Chris, I haven't talked to you or seen you in a while. So welcome. Good, e good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Chris Myers, General Services Department. Um, this evening, we brought you six resolutions so that we can continue our work with the Great Plates Program. The program is 75% funded by FEMA, 18.75% by Cal OES, and requires a 6.25% match. Based on our current program participation, the city's match will likely fall between $37,000 to $112,000. Uh, State statistics, there are 36 agencies statewide involved in this program, 27,432 participants. Uh, as of yesterday, 1,027,000 meals have been served, 200,000 meals, 200, meals delivered a week, and 432 food providers uh, statewide. On our side, for Citrus Heights, uh, we are averaging 377 applications that have been received, 171 residents, which does fluctuate, that are currently enrolled per week. Uh, some people add, some people drop. It's a back and forth game. Uh, we're averaging 3,500, almost uh, 3,600 meals a week delivered. And each resident receives three meals. So they get a hot lunch, a reheatable dinner, and a breakfast for the following morning. And as of today, we have roughly about 155,000 that the city has invested back into the business community. Uh, this program, which has been tremendous, and on a social level, a lot of work has been done uh, with the help of Nicole and Megan. Uh, there have been over 2,300,000 impressions. Re uh, regional media coverage, Fox 40 came out live and did a few spots. Uh, local media coverage on the Sentinel, the Messenger. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, linked next door, and YouTube. Uh, web pages, business newsletters, homepage, newsflash section. And then a lot of online interaction with a lot of parents um, and their children trying to get enrolled in this program. We've met a lot of people who don't live in Citrus Heights, but their parents do. And they obviously found out about this program and have done their due diligence to get their seniors enrolled. Uh, we've mailed letters and mini flyers to community leaders, volunteers, and more. We've mailed letters to seniors on their city mailing lists. And then Allison was gracious enough to hand deliver flyers to the Citrus Heights Bingo Group when they did a drive through uh, bingo. Our food providers uh, currently are Beach Hut Deli, Boston's Pizza, Ciro's Pizza Cafe, Dos Coyotes, NorCal Subs, and Arvita Cantina. Um, Ciro's and uh, NorCal Subs have reached the limit on their contract. We had uh, them almost at 50 
uh, 50 residents a day for a week. It doesn't take long to go for $50,000, which is why we're here tonight. And then we have some pictures of just some of the quality of the food that has been delivered. Uh, these are meals pre prepared by um, Dos Coyotes Cantina. Uh, and the food portions have been more than generous, and they actually are better than the standard that was asked for in the Great Plates program. Uh, I think that, that there's been some feedback from other agencies that have not gotten this quality of food delivered. So, you know, we are very pleased that we've been able to facilitate this to the community. Uh, again, some sandwiches. There's this, an example of a breakfast that's put together. Got lots of nourishment. And then we've had a lot of part uh, participant comments that have been exceptionally positive. You know, there have been some complaints. Some people don't like certain kinds of food. And, and staff have done a very good job of trying to move people around to different restaurants to accommodate their needs. Because the, the criteria is specific when you do enroll in the program. But for example, we've got, you know, thank you. My mother really appreciates the program and all the delivery personnel have been so nice to her. Uh, I feel so blessed. I told the man this morning how much I would miss their morning visits. Thank you all again for the kindness and the generosity. And one of my favorite ones, which I think is really sums up what this program was supposed to do, besides just provide food to our senior residents who were supposed to be sheltered in place uh, for their own safety. Um, I wanted to let you know that this kindness and consideration you and all of your restaurants have shown me means so much. I'm sure I'm not alone in being grateful for not just the food, but the friendly voice every morning telling me to have a nice day. I live alone and didn't realize how much I miss connecting with other people. These people need to know that their brief visit helped me get through the difficult, scary days of change. Uh, Thank you, Chris. So yeah. I, go I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go. Please finish. I'm sorry. I I don't have anything additional to add to that. We our resolutions are to extend the the fifty thousand dollar contrast to one hundred and thirty nine thousand. The program was graciously extended through FEMA and Cal OES yesterday to take us to July tenth, and they are going to begin to work on a third extension to take us into August. With our projections on the money that we're spending, these resolutions should carry us through into August, which we anticipate to be the end of this, this program. Great. Thank you, Chris. You know, one thing that strikes me as I look at these restaurants that are involved is most of them are, you know, typically not uh, breakfast fair. So, you know, they've all gotten creative to get into the program to be able to put money not only in, back into the business, but keep people employed. So... I think it's a great program. Plus, we're feeding, uh, you know, seniors. So I, I think it's great. So, folks, we have six contracts in front of us. Our esteemed attorney with like six motions, six votes. So I'm sitting I'll, here. I'll, I'll make six motions. <laughs> okay. Right now. <laughs> I think you got to do them one at a time. But I hear you. <laughs> I, I can think of a creative way to do it. Might get it past the attorney. But Probably Jeannie, not. you want to read these? Well, I go, um, sure, Steve. Um, I'll <laughs> buzz right through them. Okay. I knew you would. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Beach Hut Deli, the Great Plates Delivered Program. Great. We have a motion. We have a second. A motion, right. Second. second. Right, several seconds. So, Amy, roll call, please. Council Member Bruins. Aye. Council Member Daniels. Aye. Council Member Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. Check mark next to Beach Hut Deli. Next. I'd like to move we approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Boston's Pizza for the Great Plates Delivered Program. We have a motion. How about a second? Second. All right, Amy. Councilmember Bruins? Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. Motion passes. Check. Boston's Pizza. Next. I move we approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with 
Ciro's Pizza for the Great Lakes Delivered Program. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Amy. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Miller. Aye. And Mayor Slowey. Aye. Ciro's Pizza. Check. Next. Okay. I uh, move we approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Central Science, California. Authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with Dos Coyotes Border Cafe for the Great Plates Delivered Program. Motion. We have a second. 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 Amy. Councilmember Bruins. Aye. Councilmember Daniels. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Miller. Aye. And Mayor Slowey. Aye. Two more motions. I, I move to approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Central Sites, California, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with NorCal Subs for the Great Plates Delivery Program. We have a motion. How about a second? Second. Second. Amy, please. Councilmember Bruins? Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. Jeannie, one more time. Okay, I move we approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Citrus Heights, California, authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with our Vida Cantina for the Great Plates Delivered Program. Second. Motion and a second. Amy. Councilmember Bruins? Aye. Councilmember Daniels? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. And Mayor Slowey? Aye. Thank you. So all have extended contracts. Beach Hut Deli, Boston Pizza, Ciro's, Dos Coyotes, NorCal Subs, and our Vida Cantina. So thank you folks. And uh, Chris and Catherine, thanks for administrating that program. I'm glad to hear one. It's going to go through July and hopefully it gets extended to August. So uh, good investment, you know, not only, uh, well, from everybody who's uh, assisting with it. So thank you. Question? Thank you. Yes. Please. Yeah, the program. So I know when the program was originally uh, created, it would provide for up to, I believe it was up to 20 restaurants and up to 500 people being served. Correct. So if, if more restaurants wanted to sign up, is that opportunity still available to them if we do further resolutions or is this it? Uh, there are additional opportunities for restaurants if they wish to step up. Uh, it has been a struggle to get people on board because most of them either want to do one meal, they, you know, breakfast is a challenge. And, and Jeff had said that earlier, it's, it's a real difficulty. We've had to talk a lot of people off of a ladder to try to get them to understand they can do this if they really want to. And we did get, you know, some very, very well thought out breakfasts, which I think are probably a lot better than what anybody anticipated, but it has been difficult. You know, we, there's a couple of local restaurants that just couldn't come up with a way to do that. And they just couldn't get there, but we are, open and engaged to whoever may want to come forward. Uh, we could easily pick up four or five more, which would take the load off of everybody and then distribute that money through the rest of the community at a broader base. Right. Well, thanks, Chris. And kudos to the restaurants that have stepped up and the fact that they are doing, um, they're not just doing a minimum job, but they're, they're really making this work for our communities. Yeah, I have to say the picture of that dinner that uh, Chris showed was actually better than the di dinner I had tonight. So I'm yeah. jealous. <laughs> I won't tell your wife you said that. Yeah, well, she's out of town. That's why my dinner. Oh. Was <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next item, Amy. Next item is department reports, um, which we've already done. And next is city manager items. Yes, Mr. thank Boyd. you. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Good evening. Chris Boyd, city manager. Uh, just a few items um, this evening uh, related to uh, COVID. So our county will be moving forward into stage three of California's uh, resilience roadmap uh, tomorrow, uh, June 12th. So our city's website and social media channels will be sharing the latest public health order in the morning which will outline the complete list of businesses and activities included in this next stage. While we are excited for more of Citrus Heights businesses to reopen, our first priority is always resident safety. So we do urge everyone to continue following uh, recommendations like regular hand washing, social distancing, wearing face masks, and physical distancing isn't realistic. 
Uh, we urge our business community to take a look at our economic development section of our website. So for further guidance and several resources, I want to remind our community that free COVID-19 testing is still available to those over 18 in Citrus Heights. So as of early May, you don't need to be exhibiting any symptoms to get an appointment for the free test, as was the case before. And again, this information is on the city COVID-19 webpage. In addition to the COVID-19 updates, I wanted to share that our staff remain dedicated to moving forward important projects for our community's future, including the specific plan for the Sunrise Mall. I want to invite our community to join the virtual workshop on Tuesday, June 30th. City staff will be sharing the project's vision, which is based on feedback from our residents, city council, and key stakeholders. You can tune in from any smartphone, computer, or tablet. We'd love to see the same kind of engagement that we had at our first community workshop. And if the council recalls, we had over 300 people attend that. So to find out more about the vision to revitalize Sunrise Mall or to register for our virtual workshop, please visit sunrisetomorrow.net. So finally, I want to share that I'm really proud of this community's solid roots and all the ways that I've seen neighbors compassionately helping each other. So let's continue to take care of each other as we work through this. So with that, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Manager Boyd. Appreciate your comments. Next item, Amy. The next item is items requested by council members or any future agenda items. Anything from the council? <clears throat> the only thing I will comment on is I know uh, <clears throat> I've spoken to City Manager Boyd. I think some of the rest of you have. But we are, uh, you, you know, looking at the, when we can get back in council chambers, i.e. in-person meetings, uh, doing it safely. <clears throat> um, Definitely 